this session. Uh, I know that uh, this is lunchtime uh, for many of us, uh, and uh, I know that this is the last session of a um, very exciting week um, as of 2020. Thanks for being here. Uh, we have now this session that uh, was organized by the uh, Italian Chemical Society, the young group of the Italian Chemical Society, and sponsored by the Royal Society of Chemistry and uh, um, Science Magazine. And uh, the idea behind this session was to discuss about some topics that are not enough discussed about uh, and that are um, becoming more and more important uh, uh, for young researchers. Uh, the four speakers, exceptional speakers that we have for these sessions are in the pictures that you can see on my slide. Uh, we have Chris Wolston, uh, he's a journalist, uh, journalist uh, who writes, among others, for Nature, and who's very interested uh, in discussing about uh, um, mental health issues uh, um, that affect uh, or that could affect young researchers. He will join us uh, um, in a bit uh, since he's in the US and it's uh, night time for him. We have uh, um, Dr. Jenny Zhang, and she is a uh, group leader at the University of Cambridge at the chemistry department. We have uh, Dr. Jörg Stang, something like that, sorry for the mispronunciation, uh, who is a um, coach consultant, uh, co um, career consultant uh, for HFP Consulting from Germany. And then we have Dr. Diego Zanelli, who's a um, clinical psychologist working in, Ed in Edinburgh. I don't want to steal too much time from their uh, talks, so I just want to introduce um, the uh, topic of mental health issues for young researchers. And I want to do that uh, um, using some uh, very useful uh, um, um, posters that have been drawn uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, Zo Iris, um, who um, prepared some posters uh, about mental health issues faced by undergrads, by PhD students, by postdocs, and by um, group, young group leaders uh, in academia, even though mental health issues uh, are issues that could affect researchers even outside academia, in the industry world, uh, and in other kind of environments. And the only thing I want to show you, and these, all of these posters are available for download for free online. You can follow her uh, and find her on Twitter if you're interested about that, about this. But what I wanted to show you is that uh, if we look, for example, at, at the kind of mental health issues that could affect um, PhD students and that uh, PhD students could face throughout their uh, PhD path, uh, there are some, like those that I have highlighted here, like the imposter syndrome or the competitive landscape that they have around them when they um, are um, leaving this um, um, part of their career. Um, these are the same kind of mental health issues that also a, a more senior uh, academic would face. The imposter syndrome still uh, could be present throughout the whole path uh, of our career and uh, the competition is something that characterizes the whole career um, of a scientist. So this was just to say that uh, this is not a session or this is not a topic that we want that we need to discuss uh, for only a specific group of uh, researcher, but this could affect every one of us in every time, in any time of our career. So what I want to start with is uh, um, some are some questions uh, that uh, I hope that you will um, join, uh, join us in answering. So what you need to do now uh, is you is to go uh, to um, is to go to this website that you can see on the screen, uh, www.menti.com. 
Uh, so I will share it. Uh, just give me a second. Okay. Here we are. You should be able to see this now, hopefully. Okay, let's go in full screen. Okay, so what I want you to do is uh, I want you to go to this uh, website here, www.menti.com. So if you do, you can do that uh, on your phone uh, so that you can keep seeing us. And uh, uh, when you get to the um, homepage, uh, you will have to introduce a code. And this code is reported here is 625245. So if you do this, and actually I will do that as well together with you, you'll see that you have this same screen that I have right now. And then if I go forward, you will be able to see this question. So when we say mental health issues, and of course we are discussing about young researchers, so in the context of uh, research for young researchers, what's the first thing or the first few things that you, can, that you think of? I will give you 30 seconds. You have the opportunity to write down three options, three words um, or combination of words that you think of when you think about, when you read mental health issues in the uh, research environment. And then I will, we will start seeing your results. Okay, so we start seeing um, some questions, uh, some answers, uh, and uh, I guess we can uh, start seeing that some of these are actually uh, the same for many of us. Yeah, we see this word cloud growing. We can see that the major word is actually stress. Uh, that is probably uh, the first thing that we would uh, that many of us would think of, and we see uh, anxiety, we see competitivity, we see self-criticism, uh, we see quite a lot of uh, um, common themes here, and uh, we will probably discuss about many of these, uh, not only during the talks, the talks, but also during the, um, during the uh, discussion that we have later on. So let's move now to the next question, and we will save all of these so that they should be they would be available uh, for download and uh, to discuss about later. So if we move to the next question, and this should be um, um, already on your uh, screen, if how often do you feel anxious, overstressed, worried when we talk about in, in your research context? <laughs> Okay. It looks like that um, even if we have we had some options uh, that say that uh, you might not feel anxious, this is definitely not the um, most common answer. Okay, so we have a um, sort of positive answer that is only when deadlines are approaching, but most of the answers that you are giving is that you feel anxious or overstressed or worried quite frequently. Okay, so definitely the fact that only 15 or a bit less percent um, feels um, this kind of uh, feelings almost, con well, now it's 25%. Let's say that the fact that frequently is the um, um, most common answer is definitely something that um, gives some kind of hope that is not continuous. 
even though um, I know that uh, there's many of us that um, feel these kind of feelings uh, very often, and uh, uh, hopefully this session will help us in uh, understanding what's the best um, path uh, to take in this kind of situation. Now we go to the last question before the start of the talks. So when you did experience stress and anxiety, or in case you were to experience them, so imagine that in case you have never experienced stress and anxiety, you were to experience, but you still were to experience them. Would you look for help and support or not? So the question, the answers were three. Yes, but I would go to friends or family to talk about the issues that I'm facing. Yes, I would go to mental health care professionals. Uh, or no, I wouldn't ask for help. Everything would just go away. Or, of course, um, no, I wouldn't need it. Okay, I'll give you just a few more, uh, 10 seconds to, um, in case you haven't finished answering these questions. Okay, so it's very promising, I must say, that uh, um, the majority of you all, uh, in case you have to, you, you experience stress and anxiety, or in case you were to experience them, um, you would look for help. That's very, very important. Um, it's also very interesting that uh, the majority of you would go to friends and family, maybe colleagues, maybe because they've, you think or you know that they've experienced something similar in a different uh, time frame. So you would go for someone that is expert in the same way. Um, but it's also very important that um, many of us would seek for um, professional advice. OK, so we can uh, stop this now, and we can start with the um, experts talk. And the first expert that uh, um, we have with us is uh, uh, Diego Zanelli, who, as I said before, is a clinical psychologist working in Edinburgh who has uh, quite a lot of experience with academics. And so, Diego, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, morning. Thanks Claudia for uh, the introduction and the opportunity to be here to talk about this very uh, relevant um, theme, uh, this very relevant topic. Um, so I wish I could see you all, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm glad we have managed to make it uh, anyway. So um, I decided to give uh, this name to my talk and I called it, uh, What Can We Learn From uh, Academics in Therapy? And uh, I, um, I gave it this name because uh, I think it says something about my uh, particular point of view on uh, this topic, which is the point of view of a therapist who works with academics. And I also think that the uh, nice thing of today's uh, event is that we are going to hear to uh, different point of views because mine is different from the point of view uh, of a PhD student or of a PI. And uh, therefore, I think that today uh, each speaker will be bring something different and interesting to the table. So uh, I thought that it could be interesting to uh, see with you what academics uh, say about their academic life in a particular setting, which is the setting where uh, I see them. So the setting of uh, a psychotherapy. And you have to imagine that this is a sort of setting where there is uh, free speech, so someone can uh, open up and have a full disclosure. There is no judgment, no evaluation, 
uh, and especially no uh, social stigma. And uh, uh, I would like to share just one, uh, one thing with you, which I think is quite interesting. And is that when I moved here uh, to Edinburgh and I started working in private practice, and uh, so my, my work was uh, open to everyone, of course, and this is just to say that uh, it wasn't focused or specifically designed for academics. And very soon I came to realize that roughly the 35 or 40 percent uh, of my uh, clients were academics uh, who brought into therapy academic related issue. So uh, at that point, uh, I came to realize that perhaps uh, there is a quite broad problem uh, of mental health issues uh, among academics. And I think these are uh, interesting numbers. So uh, I thought uh, I could structure my talk uh, in, in uh, two parts. So uh, on the first part, I would like to share with you some uh, fragments of uh, therapy sessions that I had with academics. And uh, I picked up some examples because I think that they uh, point out and they uh, underline some crucial aspects of uh, academic life. And I chose them also because I believe they uh, represent some of the most uh, recurrent themes and topics reported by academics in therapy. And then on the second part, uh, I would like to uh, highlight some guidelines, tips, or useful resources to address mental health issues in academia. Just a very quick disclaimer, uh, I would like to tell you that uh, all the facts that I'm going to share with you are of course based on true stories, but they have been changed in a way that no one can recognize anyone. So uh, said that, uh, I would like to start with what we can call uh, case number one. Uh, so this was a session with a, uh, a lecturer who told me that uh, at some point his wife was at the hospital for an emergency. And while this lecturer was going to the hospital, uh, he told me that uh, while he was going there, he phoned a PhD uh, student of him. Uh, he told her where to find the keys to have access to the apartment, the password of his laptop, and uh, where she could find a file, which was a paper, which had to be submitted as soon as possible to a journal. In fact, the situation was that uh, this lecturer knew that there was another research group in the world who reached very similar uh, results. So basically, uh, it was a kind of race on who would have been the first one to, uh, to publish. And he told me that afterwards, uh, he felt extremely guilty and ashamed for uh, the priority given to this over uh, the fact that he was going to the hospital uh, to check on, on, on the wife. So I think that this first uh, fragment of a session that I'm sharing with you uh, highlights quite a few things. Uh, if I had to choose some keywords to describe it, uh, I would say priorities, boundaries, balance, and overcommitment. I think this is uh, an example of how important it should be to uh, set up some limits and boundaries uh, to find the balance and equilibrium between your private life and your academic life, especially when the second one, so the academic life, takes over the first one, your personal and private life. And uh, uh, it's an example also that made me think about um, a saying which is very well known among academics, and it goes like, publish or perish. And they thought that uh, this example is almost a literal translation of this saying. So um, I uh, would leave you with some uh, questions about this first example, such as what is worth it? And what are we, are we willing to sacrifice and what for when we are uh, trying to achieve and develop an academic career? Said that, I would move on the second case. Uh, this time uh, uh, it was about uh, a postdoc. Uh, well, actually, uh, it was uh, someone who recently became a, a postdoc. So she was a PhD before she finished it, uh, she became a postdoc. 
And uh, um, as soon as we might say, as soon as she passed on the other side, so she was no longer a student, there were no longer uh, mentors to look at or to refer to. So basically she became uh, in a peer and she was involved in all the aspects of the, of the process and of the academic life. She quickly realized that the academic life was not how she thought uh, it would be. So, for example, that it was also made by uh, admin work, uh, short-term contracts uh, versus a path that until that point was very much structured and linear. That uh, another thing that she mentioned was that the salaries were quite different from uh, other people who uh, chose to do a different job, for example, in private companies that research is not always carried out in a pure scientific way, that labs can be disorganized. So uh, overall, I would say that uh, her pure idea of academic life was demolished. And uh, at that point, this person had a sort of identity crisis because uh, she had always pictured herself as an academic at that point, she no longer liked it, but at the same time, she didn't know uh, what else she could do or what else she could be. So uh, this second example uh, made me think about one specific word, which is, in my opinion, very much related to uh, academic life. And this word is idealization. And I mean it in a very uh, psychological sense, because I think that uh, Academic career, uh, the achieving of academic career is something which can be extremely easily idealized, especially by uh, students and PhDs, because often uh, only one side is emphasized. And this is a side made by the fascination of, for example, groundbreaking discoveries or the idea that professors know everything and no one tells them what else uh, involves being uh, an academic. No one tells them that professor, being a professor, for example, implies spending weeks in writing a grant and so on. And also, um, we must say that as a matter of fact, if, for example, 100 PhDs start this career, only a few will reach the end. So it's important that along the journey, uh, you are open to explore other possibilities if, and other options if things don't go as planned. So in a way, uh, we might say that it's very important to de-idealize the academic career and uh, have always a full spectrum of this life in order to make fully aware choices. Now, I would move, uh, I would move on uh, the third and last uh, case. And uh, this time, um, I would like to talk about this uh, PhD student who came to therapy with a strong doubt on whether to continue or uh, to stop uh, uh, his PhD, because he realized that uh, the project didn't have any meaning to him, and that he chose it uh, more for the opportunity to do a PhD than uh, uh, for a genuine interest or desire for it. And also he said uh, that uh, he thought that this project didn't serve any particular purpose for the people, for the humanity. So uh, I would say that from a clinical point of view, there was a strong lack of meaning in what he was uh, so hardly doing in his life. Uh, and also, and this is another important detail, and perhaps we will have the chance to discuss it further later on, uh, the supervisor, his supervisor, didn't acknowledge any of that focusing only on the technical and scientific aspects, despite the fact that this PhD student was trying to address to him the difficulties. So he felt he was in the wrong place, that he was not good enough for the academic life. So this uh, third example, third case, um, has to do, in my opinion, with words such as purpose and meaning. In a way that, for example, you can do the same thing for different reasons. For example, you can be a doctor because you want to help people, or uh, you can be a doctor because you want to make money, for example. So it's important to figure out what you truly desire and why you choose a specific path over another. And also, uh, it's fundamental that you find a balance between your personal interest 
and what you want to achieve and uh, what are instead uh, external pressures. Uh, so another example uh, that comes to my mind is about a, another patient, for example, who chose to do quantitative research, even though he uh, didn't like it, over qualitative research because he said that doing quantitative research gave him more chances to publish. Or for example, another patient who was suffering from uh, a very uh, hard pressure to prove that the uh, drug that she was testing worked because that very drug was provided by the same company who paid for her PhD. So she felt all the pressure in uh, developing her project. And uh, one last point that this example highlights uh, is about the uh, role of supervisors who often don't know how to deal with psychological, uh, emotional, or uh, existential issues of their students, uh, even though they are the ones students would expect something from as being their mentors and somehow uh, in charge for, uh, for their future. So uh, I think that uh, in order to conclude uh, this uh, first part, uh, I would say that these three examples underline some fundamental ideas to keep in mind. First, that it's important to figure out which the priorities are between your personal and academic life, making sure that there are limits and boundaries between the two. Second, try to avoid any sort of idealization of the academic career, try to have always a full spectrum of it, and to explore uh, different options for your career. Three, don't do it for the sake of it, but because you can find the purpose and the meaning relevant for you. And last but not least, obviously, and this is uh, the purpose of this event, uh, take care of your mental health along the journey. Now, uh, I would very quickly move on the last part. Uh, um, I Now I will need to use my PowerPoint. I'm not sure if you have been seeing me or the PowerPoint until this point. Okay, great. So now I would like to show you just uh, some um, final slides about which might be the difficulties in dealing with mental health issues. So first of all, the idea that it's something that uh, it will go away or the idea that it's something that we can handle. Uh, then there is the fear of uh, social stigma and uh, judgments. There is the fact that it's not a visible problem. So it's harder for our friends or other people to understand and see what we are going through. And then, especially for those who work in an academic environment, uh, it's always a matter of performative expectations, which seem to be more important than personal needs. Of course, if we want to uh, do something and act uh, to address these problems, we have to do it at different levels. One is the level of the institution, so like the academia, the university. For example, improving the counseling service or especially developing research in this field. Then uh, there is a second level which involves the academic population. For example, promoting uh, events like this one here today or peer groups and workshops and so on. And the third level has to do with, uh, with the individual. For example, seeking for professional support uh, or uh, uh, trying to open up about this problem. Very last slide, uh, I would like to share with you some uh, useful resources. First one is about uh, academic counseling service. Every university uh, has this sort of service, which are usually free, or anyway, they have very affordable fees. It's true on one hand that uh, they often provide a very short number of uh, sessions, but on the other hand, this could be a first step to start addressing the problem. Then nowadays, thanks to um, technology, we also have plenty of online counseling service, which is another very useful resource because you can uh, deal with this problem uh, with these sort of issues in your uh, native language, which makes it uh, a way easier. And also uh, you can overcome the fact that perhaps uh, you live uh, abroad 
in a remote country and you can get in touch with a professional who talks your same language. And uh, third, we have counseling and psycho psychotherapy in a very uh, traditional way where you can find uh, uh, professionals and sometimes with an expertise tailored to help people who uh, work in academia, you can have uh, a confidential space, space in, in which uh, you can fully open up uh, and try to uh, address any sort of problem. So uh, I think that time is up for me. So I will stop here and we will talk more uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Diego, for uh, this very, very interesting talk. And uh, um, I guess that the key point, I, know I don't want to steal too much time, but uh, I guess the key point that you mentioned, that is take care of your mental health, uh, is the main theme of today. Uh, and I also like the fact that you mentioned the different levels uh, that we can, um, uh, let's say, modulate. Uh, to um, introduce new ways of uh, addressing these mental health issues. And this ties very well with the next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Jenny Zhang, uh, who uh, as a um, very young uh, group leader, uh, will, is able to give us uh, um, both the way of someone who just left the um, uncertain, well, not that we lose uh, uncertainty at some, we get certainty at some point, but uh, who just stopped being supervised and started being super, uh, starting, started supervising uh, so that she can give us some uh, feedback on what a supervisor or what uh, academic figures uh, can do for um, people facing mental health issues. Uh, Jenny, thanks for being with us. Hi everyone, my name is Jenny. Um, thank you very much, Claudia, for involving me in this um, very interesting and needed in conversation. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm a new group member, uh, group leader at uh, the Department of Chemistry uh, at University of Cambridge. So what I'd like to do today is to share with you my experience um, and hopefully to give some tips that I've uh, and lessons that I learned along the way. So um, just to give you a sense of uh, what my academic trajectory has been. So um, starting from when I did my PhD, so I was actually, you can probably tell a little bit from my accent, I, uh, I grew up in Australia and uh, I did my PhD at University of Sydney. This is my research group. Um, I followed it with a small stint um, at, at the University of Jerusalem, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, after my PhD, I acquired my own fellowship um, and I moved to England to uh, join a group at the University of Cambridge and this is my new group where then after my fellowship I helped my PI to secure a very large grant which then helped me to get a promotion to, uh, to become a senior postdoc um, and at this point I wrote my a grant for myself uh, and then I was able to start my launch my own group uh, two years ago and this is my, my lovely group here right now and so you probably see this um, in in, uh, uh, in most CV. So you see people's trajectories, um, probably a list of their publications, their awards, you know, all the best things, but you never really see the ups and downs um, of that journey. So what I thought uh, I can bring to the table today is actually just to share with you some of my roller coaster and my ups and downs. So I'll just start with my PhD. So um, obviously everyone's journey is very, very different. So I compared to, so this is a, a roller coaster that I made from my own journey and I compared it against actually some uh, research that was done by uh, uni uh, uh, people in university in, in Australia where they took surveys of PhD students from all um, different stages uh, and then they, they related it to their emotional levels. And so for me, I started my PhD on a bit of a high. So I was really excited, lots of anticipation, very, 
enthusiastic to start a project I was really interested in. You can see that it's an upward trajectory, and that's very similar to um, what uh, Morrison and Saunders observed as well from from other PhD students, where um, mostly the feelings were quite positive in the beginning. Now, where mine deviated was that I very quickly discovered how competitive it was um, because I, I did get some very positive results, but then very quickly entered into a conflict uh, over ownership of a certain paper uh, with a postdoc in my own group, nonetheless. And so that, you know, was quite shocking for me. I didn't realize it's just how um, competitive and ruthless uh, this environment could be. Um, now, luckily, we resolved that and, and the paper got published. Um, but following that, I entered into my middle stage and, and at this point um, I was I could see that from the paper as well that this is the where we all kind of experience a bit of a slump uh, and this slump comes from the fact that your experiments do not work as you anticipate it. It may take longer than anticipated. And then you're looking around, you see other people, and it seems like their experiments are working really well. So you start to compare yourself to others, and obviously that doesn't uh, <laughs> always turn out well. And then at this stage also, you, you're starting to want to um, experience teaching, or maybe you join some committee members so you can gain other skills and sometimes that take up some of your time and that gives you a huge sense of guilt because you're not prioritizing your PhD anymore uh, and linked with the, the failed experiments um, that really does diminish uh, and your mood and, and cause a lot of stress and anxiety. Um, now uh, in, in my case you can see that um, uh, I try to overcompensate and a lot of people try to do that too with long hours. So I used to be working uh, over 70 hours per week, much more than that sometimes, where I was just trying to make up lost time and it just spiraled down. Now, what happened next is um, as I entered into the third part of my PhD, so the end part of um, end phase, um, at this point, typically what Morrison and Saunders observed was that people had lots of ups and downs. You can imagine that people become very frustrated, sometimes very anxious. They don't know, you know, the aim of a PhD is to make an original contribution to knowledge. Uh, have they made uh, a significant enough contribution? Are they good enough? Um, that's the point where people start to reflect. And obviously, uh, panic starts to set in as well because your funding's running out, you have deadlines, etc. So there's a lot of low points. Um, now, also, some um, you could, some people can see that the the research is coming together, and then you get elation. And now, for me, I. On my side, I did something slightly different. Instead of wrapping up, I went on exchange. I went to a different lab and I got a different expen uh, perspective. Um, and I went to Israel, as I pointed out. Now, I don't know if, um, or for those of you who, who've been to Israel, have lived there, you know that they, they observe the Shabbat, which means that on the weekend, um, the university basically completely shut down. So you could not go in on the weekend. So that forced me to basically take two days off and also, um, um, it made me much more efficient during the weekdays and I was completely transformed so I, I was able to be much more creative productive etc um, and also results started coming out um, so I was much happy at that point um, and I was able to then um, wrap everything up and start writing and, and hand it in and and most people describe the hand in as a bit of an anticlimactic process and I have to agree um, it's mainly when the papers start coming out that you really start to feel like you're banking in or you're um, experiences but obviously with that there's lots of rejections that come with it and then you start there's also doubt that goes with that so it's a bit of a roller coaster um, and then after your your papers uh, have started to bank or roll in that's when you start to think oh maybe I can go think of myself as an academic maybe I can do a, a postdoc and that's when I started um, hunting for postdocs Again, lots of rejections, it wasn't an easy process at all, even though it sounded like, oh, I just landed on a fellowship. Actually, lots of um, learned failures and, and bad uh, first drafts. And then um, eventually um, I was lucky enough to have uh, one come through. So that's my PhD experience. And, and it's somewhat aligned with what others have observed. Now, when I come to think about my postdoc experience, um, it was, uh, I guess, there's less research on this and probably because uh, every postdoc experience um, is very, very different. But um, I think there's some commonalities that I could find from what I could read on, on blogs at least. So when you start a postdoc, usually you are starting a new lab, a new project. Now that can be a very positive thing because you might, you, you might like um, the 
the change in the scenery, but also for some people, it could be extremely isolating and you're starting something from fresh. Um, now, I was really excited to have this um, opportunity to basically expand my skill sets. And um, it is a chance and the purpose is to reach scientific maturity so that you, you know what you want to be the leader in the field for if you're going for an academic career. Now, starting my postdoc, I was quite positive, but very quickly, because you are doing something new, um, very likely you face setbacks again with learning curves and, and the lack of results. Now, at this point, you're trained to think very critically, and that also means you start to think very critically of yourself and your own research. And you think, oh, is this actually the right thing to be researching? Oh, am I actually um, a good scientist, when, especially when things don't go right? Um, and this is where... Um, um, I guess imposter syndrome is extremely um, common as well as I'm sure on other times as well but this is a time definitely when I felt it the most um, and it's uh, again the competitiveness is always in the background and as a postdoc you're expected to deliver things quicker um, and a high quality and so uh, you know not being able to deliver is incredibly stressful and then again that even if you had uh, established some sort of healthy lifestyle you go back to going okay I, I need to just concentrate on this and 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 yeah a lot of self-care got um, sacrificed and tied in with that and as mentioned by Diego is the low pay with uh, the ambiguous status so you're in this limbo zone where you just you don't know how to describe your career to to your friends and family so um, all of this ties into um, a, a downward spiral until uh, papers start coming out so until so your your existence and your move really is defined by your results uh, which which is not a, a good thing but that's what happened okay so good results few papers yes rejection okay back down again but after your papers, um, assuming that papers come through, that's when you start to think, okay, I've now ticked off that box, I can go to the next stage, I can go for applications for the next step. And again, there's going to be lots of rejections, the timing's not right, sometimes it's not, not about you, sometimes it's the other party. But anyway, so there was a lot of trial and error, and eventually um, I was able to secure um, a, a fellowship which allowed me to launch my um, own uh, lab, which I'll talk about in a second. But I just want to comment a little bit about this whole experience. You can see there's lots of valleys, lots of dips and, and rises. Um, and there's a lot here in terms of the negatives, in terms of how competitive it is, the, the lack of work-life balance. Um, a lot of that is uh, not really, sometimes that it's inflicted by ourselves, but actually sometimes, um, and very significantly, a huge role is played by the supervisor. And I've, I've set this um, uh, example here. So this is actually recognized by the, the same paper I referenced before, the importance of the role of the supervisor in setting the tone um, and also the, the, the student or, I guess, researcher supervisor relationship really is a key factor in the success of the research process. And here I've, I've um, dug up this letter. It's a very famous letter that I'm, maybe some of you have seen. I've now removed the name of the person, but you can see it's Associate Professor of Chemistry in Caltech. This happened about 20 years ago, but actually you can very easily, I'm sure some of you can relate to this, this has happened to me. It's basically a, um, a supervisor, a junior group member, uh, PI, who um, is telling their postdoc that they're very unhappy with the fact that they're taking the weekends off, they're not waking, working on the evenings, um, that now they even want to have holidays, they want that corrected immediately, and if not, they can be replaced. So you can see that the tone of um, this is extremely toxic. Um, and I think now being a PI, you reflect on this and you think, why are PIs like this? Why are they driven to be like this? Like they're not born like this, obviously. And so then I started thinking about, okay, what is my roller coaster now as a PI? Now, the aim of a PI, if you think about it, is to become a faculty member and a leader in a research field. And in the beginning, it's, it's a, a huge height because you're now completely free, you're autonomous, you get to own your own ideas, you're not just giving your ideas to your previous boss, you're leading, um, you've got gravitas, you've got status. So all these things are really positive in the beginning. But what um, I guess we didn't expect is that now we can't rely on just ourselves with results. You know, you can't control that. You know, you rely on other people to, to um, help you acquire results. And as a PR, you have very high expectations to deliver, especially if you want to become um, all of these things, the aims. 
and require many new responsibilities that you haven't done before. And for me personally, that I really recognize is a loss of diversity. I suddenly looked around and go, oh, my colleagues are all uh, not so diverse anymore. Um, and it's quite lonely, it can be. And that sense of insecurity that Claudia referred to before, that's present all the time. I've talked to very mature senior PIs. They also feel this insecurity, um, even if they have job security, because you always have to be leading the field. So you always have to be um, performing at your best and, and, and a step ahead of others. So in terms of, I guess, like some illustrative examples of um, the journey of a young PI. So for me, quickly, I discovered, oh, where's the diversity gone? Oh, OK, I see this is what they were talking about. And then because you are a young PI, you only have maybe one postdoc or maybe one PhD student. It's a very slow start. And then coupled with that, you have lots of other commitments that um, you quickly have to add to your timetable. Um, so the progress is quite slow in the beginning. And at the same time, you know, you've got lots of competitions and it only starts to build up very, very slowly. And then you get some results, which is fantastic. And then you get scooped by a bigger group who has uh, more momentum, bigger team, more well-funded. So you can see the pressure um, and, and, you know, what is going into making a PI uh, to be, I guess, um, placing lots more pressure on their, their group, uh, as you can see with the previous letter. So you can see what went into that kind of thinking. So, I mean, now having reflected on all of this, I was thinking, well, what are ways that we can, what, what ways can we help each other? Okay, so keeping this in mind, keeping both sides in mind. So what can group leaders do? If you are just going to be, if you're going to be um, starting group in the new future, I really think it's very important to get leadership training. So obviously, the leader, the, the PI from the letter that I showed, he um, he wanted the, his postdoc to be performing at his best, to be delivering, to be most productive. But he just had no idea how to motivate him and to bring out his best. And it's part of that is because of the fact that as scientists, we're trained to be very technically good. And sometimes you get you may get some experience leading along the way, but you never technically trained. And so you don't know how to motivate people. You don't know how to lead. And I think getting leadership training and just being admitting that, oh, it, you're not above getting leadership training is really important. Clear expectations being communicated at the beginning. So as early as possible, so that there's no run in with ownership problems. And also you, you can communicate to your group members what you expect in terms of you know what is a um what is uh, enough work and what isn't and and so that you don't ha come into it later when someone expects that to be able to take holidays i mean yeah, so having mutual expectations um, and a discussion of it at the start to make sure everyone's on the same page is really important um, and then cultivating a healthy, inclusive group culture. So um, that could be a lot of different things. So first of all, um, avoiding um, hierarchy so that everyone is respected the same way, even though they have different responsibilities and avoiding favoritism, which is incredibly toxic, but also creating a safe space for people to discuss problems, which is something that I think Diego was mentioning is completely lacking because PIs just think, oh, you know, we're just so focused on our goals that um, any Anything outside of that is outside of my my jurisdiction and and actually no when you're leading you have to lead a team which means you have to create a space for teams to verbalize problems um, and be humans essentially um, and just realizing that you are going to be a role model which means that you are setting examples for other people which means you have to be better um, and and also what that means is that showing that you're also human is also fine you know showing failure and rejections, as I've shown, is very common and okay, and you'll bounce back from it, and that's completely normal. Um, and the last point I think is completely obvious. So I think these are small things that group leaders, up and coming group leaders, can be doing better um, to um, help with this, those situations. But in lack of that, if you don't have a PI who, who's interested in doing those things, there are lots of things you can do for yourself. Um, and I hope that we'll talk about a lot of these. I, these this is not at all exhaustive, I just put on a few points you know I will stress on this a little bit more build on this a little bit more but obviously self-care self-compassion really important seeing failure as not the end of the world but actually you can gain a lot from it being um, able to let go of control and just embrace the fact that you know there's a lots of unknowns and things that you can't um, control in your life and just maintaining a 
a healthy perspective where um, you're not your worth your self-worth is not defined by your results and, and your papers and obviously if none of that um, or if that is not enough definitely seek professional help like like Diego says because um, there's no shame in it and I've done it and it's been very very helpful so uh, with my remaining, I think, two minutes, I'm just going to very, very quickly run through what a support network might look like. Um, so to make a, a support network, these are the five types of people you want in, in it. So I think the first one is very, very obvious. Your cheerleaders, people who will just celebrate with you, but also remind you that you are worth, you know, that to keep going if you don't succeed because you're, you're worth it. And so it's my family, obviously, my spouse, etc. And hopefully many people will have this. Um, mentors, this is something that um, I guess uh, is always talked about and your department is likely to assign you these. Um, as a postdoc, I got signed these. Um, and even as a PI, I got signed these. Now, this doesn't have to come about through official um, means. And I think actually it works much better if, it, if you gain your mentors organically. Basically, you just look for people with relevant experience and a similar background to you so that they can empathize with you. Um, and very important, they must be happy and have time to invest in you. Sometimes your, your you know, situ life situations don't match and then that's fine too. And it's a very, it could be very casual um, as needed. So it can be very long, it can be very short. Um, uh, they must be able to give honest feedback. Um, and I think I should stress that you mustn't be afraid to also give up bad mentors if you see them. And we, if we have time, we can maybe discuss what that means um, because having no mentors is actually better than having bad mentors because you see that some bad mentors don't actually have your best interest at heart. But anyway, having mentors are very, very useful. And usually your supervisor should act like one um, if, if possible. Now, coaches are really important to have. These are people who have mastered the craft and they want to help you and they can help you to do well as well. Um, so these are much more short term and specific, structured, um, much more um, instructive and they can be hired. So it could be, for example, someone showing you how to use a technique. So they could be technicians. It could be someone who um, is coaching you how to be a better leader, you know, how to um, draw better cover images, things like that. Um, and so these are really useful people to have and, and definitely asking for help from coaches coaches and if you can afford it paying for it really really useful um peers now these are, i cannot under um estimate i cannot understate how important these are people in your life uh, in your line of work sorry who are going some, to do something similar to you and they're around the same level as you now claudia's um survey of uh where people go to look for help i could see that they went to their family and friends but no one went to their peers why not because these are people who go through the same thing as you they would be so useful for you and you probably see that they're going through exactly the same emotions as you and that they can use your help as well so that's really important and then obviously friends basically these are different to peers because they understand you and what your heart wants and they know your values and so they know you outside of your work which is really important so that's um, what a supportive network may look like and obviously um, building a, a, a support network doesn't mean just you taking 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 you also have to give back. So when possible, when appropriate, um, be someone's cheerleader, mentor, or coach. And I'm going to leave you with this funny post that I found um, on, my, on my Facebook, which is basically about uh, what we need in mentors, uh, which uh, is very similar to what predatory journals uh, are also giving. And, and with that, um, good luck. Thank you. OK. Um... Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very, very, very nice talk. Uh, and thanks for sharing your ups and downs in your career. Uh, I'm sure many of us uh, um, would see uh, our own path exactly in the same way. Uh, and also thanks for reminding all of us that uh, you bounce back from these lows. Um, so we go now to the next speaker. Uh, who will uh, give some additional tips on how to um, face uh, um, uh, mental health issues. And our next speaker is Jörg Tange um, from Germany, uh, who is a consultant uh, for HFP Consulting. Uh, Jörg, the floor is yours.
Hello, everybody. Thank you, Claudia, for the nice introduction. And uh, yeah, perfect pronunciation of my last name. You know, I lived a while in the UK, so normally it's Dr. Strange, so I'm happy about anything else. Um, yeah, I want to uh, thank my uh, colleagues and fellow speakers for bringing up so many important points, and you will potentially discover uh, things again in the talk I give. Um, it should be about um, how to increase the awareness, you know, understanding stress and to um, get some food for thought, how to basically build resilience. And the disclaimer is here, so I'm not a psychotherapist, so I, you know, I want to actually step in before mental health issues develop, to not let them happen. So I want to get into this space before people go to Diego, not to deploy of work, but to make the system a better one. And I also want to say that building resilience is not the case of taking even more and being harder and pushing through but it's actually to develop a healthier style of working and of life in the end. Um, and to start with, and I also want, uh, want to provide you with a food for thought, but no easy solution. So that's just to manage ex expectations. Um, to start with, um, I want to start with an optimistic premise. The power is with you, you know, and uh, this means you can influence something. And of course, we have to also manage expectations again, because we know that the whole science system is dysfunctional in many parts. Uh, so this is part of organizational development, and I will not touch this today, because the process of organizational development is a big part, such a long one, that it may be longer than your most of your PhD fellowships or contracts. So what I want to focus on today is actually your circle of influence. So something that you can actually change. Uh, within yourself, within your network, so the green one. And um, also we will reflect on something in a minute because we want to change something, it's good to understand it first. Before doing so, I would like to tell you a story. Um, and I should say that um, I'm a scientist by training as well, so that I forgot to say this. I'm a biologist, an immunologist, did my PhD and then did a six year postdoc in Babram, Cambridge um, and worked for six years as a postdoc and this is now a few years ago already and in parallel to the postdoc I started working as a trainer for HFP consulting so it's called consulting but we are actually a training company who um, actually specializes in leadership and career uh, development training for scientists most of our team are scientists by themselves so I always think like you have to be in this or have been in the system to understand how it works and um, when I was was I stressed at some point? Yes, I think constantly. And uh, looking back, back, I shouldn't have been, but I can tell you a story which is almost nine years ago now when I finished my PhD. Um, that was the stage I was at the, uh, close to finishing the PhD. I had a small baby and we were preparing moving to the UK. So that was the prerequisite. So a good, uh, a good basis to be stressed and I was. And how did I recognize, how was my stress uh, showing it. So I was really grumpy, you know, I was like um, tense, sometimes short in temper, I was tired constantly. Um, and I have to say, I was even ill. I mean, looking back now, I was had colds most of the time. So this, these were the symptoms. And um, this were, it was, of course, um, emphasized by all these uh, double and triple of tasks and lots of things you need to do by yourself and uncertainty connected to it. And Importantly, it was also emphasized by something within myself. I, looking back now, I should have done stuff different in the end of the PhD. I wanted to have it perfect, you know, think things where I now think that should, you know, 80% would have sufficed, you know, that there was no need for it. And I will come back to this internal component during my talk. Um, but to first, like, prime you, it would be nice to take a few minutes and ask the question, what does stress mean for you? So please look at the slide and look at the three questions. So the first one, when I'm stressed, I, so you know, I was grumpy and you can maybe answer that for yourself. I get stressed if, so what are the external things that make you stressed? And I put myself under pressure by, and I mentioned the word perfectionism, but there are others. I will um, be silent for half a minute and I will invite you to think about these questions and maybe even note some answers down and then I will proceed. So half a minute from now, you're welcome to take part.
So it's 10 more seconds to... Okay, so I'm aware that this was very short, uh, but obviously there's a difference if you do it uh, in the real life or if you do it over Zoom. And I will present you some, I will share some some input from our courses. You know, I give, I've give courses as well on career development, on stress management. And, um, you know, we, we connect sometimes and you can see people say, I get stressed if, you know, there might be something in the personal life, too many tasks. So a lot of things that Jenny also mentioned and that also have been there in Diego's talk. You're dealing with people. Oh my God, it's not only the science, there are people out there. And uh, after all, scientists are human beings. We need to recognize and value this. And expectations from others was very classic one so i think you might you know you might find yourself uh in some of these comments and you might have additional ones there's a high diversity among people and that is important and is valuable like this and then there's the question of course which i skipped now but how does stress the first one how does stress you know show how, what are the symptoms some people get angry some people do even longer hours like jenny said other people freeze. They can't do anything anymore. So there are tons of different symptoms that show and you have to know yourself best what they are. And then I always imagine there's a little camera above your head, you know, that observes you. And it's not the CCTV that you have in the UK, but it's rather something where you invest a little bit of your energy to be aware. Because it sounds stupid, but sometimes we don't even know that we are stressed. We just go on without reflection. And that's important to change. And then the second part is I put myself under pressure by, and it could be perfectionism. There could be also the high expectations. What, what might others think? Saying yes, you know, I need to help the others, um, other people's issues, then not asking for help. All these things uh, can, be coming, can come from inside. Now, this is all a bit of a patchwork. So where does it come from? So let me try to bring a bit more clarity in this. And a disclaimer here, this is not a psychologist, psychotherapist's uh, perfect model. We just use those models to bring, bring you some knowledge. So there are tons of different models out there. So what you can see is there's a life event or you're in a certain situation and then you get stressed. Hmm. And if you only see that, you can't really do something because you don't know where that stress is coming from. So this is external. And as I mentioned several times already, we have to look into what's inside, you know, and... This is different for everybody. So your brain, yourself, you are evaluating the situation you are in and you evaluate also what resources do you have to cope with this situation. And this determines in the end if there's a stress reaction and how does it look like. It means that, for example, maybe in a situation where my fellow speaker Diego is completely stressed, Claudia would still be super calm and or the other way around. This is really individual. And... Why that is like this, I want to explain a little bit of a um, more detailed model. Um, you can see that mathematically it's a triangle. If I put that, it becomes more clear. That should be an iceberg. Why the iceberg? Clear is there's a lot of stuff under the water. And I think even uh, Jenny mentioned, usually in science, you know, it's a hard job. We are dealing with facts. We are in a situation. We have some goals. So we are talking on the content level. The problem here is, as I said, it's not a problem, but we are human beings. So we have more than just uh, this. We have feelings, and um, I think feelings need to be acknowledged. This is not this old school work life where feelings are private stuff and you have to be professional in work. So you have feelings, and they're actually very important. Why? Because they will guide you what is needed. So we also say feelings are the children of needs. So if you feel, for example, anxious or insecure, the most simple one, then your need might be security. So they guide you to something. You have a first handle what you can change. And um, below the needs are values. And I saw this in both presentations. And Jenny's uh, talked about it, and especially Diego. There was a lot of this meaning, value. And why is this important? And... To say this, I first want to discriminate the need is short term. You know, if maybe one of the other people would now scream at me, my immediate need would be respect. But I can also have a value of respect. You know, this means a value that's something you um, find good, that stays with you for an extended amount of time. And most importantly, it actually influences how you make decisions. 
could be conscious and unconscious. And this is part of your, in the end, your identity. Your up, and this is influenced by your upbringing, your social context, your parents, anything else. And in the professional context, that could be the role identity, your identity as a PhD student, as a postdoc, and so on. So again, this is the relationship level. And I'm showing this to you because if you have an adverse feeling, for example, anger, fear, sadness, it can direct you to a need that is unfulfilled. And you need in the end to fulfill many of your needs to basically match your values. And that, that counts for a job as well, you know, to find the meaning, find the purpose in the end. And that comes from inside. So just a short, short um, excursion towards also a more psychological link. There are these kind of from transactional analysis, there are drivers. And they can also be unconscious at work. So I mentioned one that is uh, very much in line for myself is be perfect which when I told you about the example as a PhD student, I wasn't recognizing. And there are others like try hard, be strong, hurry up and please others. So always help others and forget your own agenda. And here you should uh, give yourself permission to not, so recognize what drivers at work, this is the first step, and then be okay with things not being perfect and see how it goes. This is very important. And the question is now, what are we doing about that? You know. You have like coping strategies and I just want to share, I think it's, it's, I want to leave some time for discussion. So you just go through it, you know, there's lots of different things and you find them diverse. Some may re uh, resonate with you, some not, because it's again individual. You might like sports, you might just, you know, retreat, you go out with other people and there's a brutal one, which is here, reality check, <laughs> you know, face reality. But this is true, you know, it's very important. And um, I think we can take this into the discussion. I see that we are, I don't want to get stressed and we are a lot, a bit short in time. So I go to my last slide with nicely. I didn't, I didn't actually communicate with Jenny, but there's lots of things that she showed already. So crucial here, connect with other people, you know, find a mentor, form a peer group and try to get this constant awareness and expand your transferable skills. I mean, I shouldn't say that, but yes, trainings are, are good. And especially ours, no, of course not. But you know, the skills that have to do with people, it's not part of the traditional academic career and it should be. And I hope we can take these things further into the discussion and um, guide you through how can you achieve purpose, you know, finding something that you're good at, you're paid for it, the world needs it and you love it. That would be the optimal. So thanks for the... Uh, um, listening and I want to thank of course the organizers Claudia and also the science community for actually bringing this to the table now and speaking about this very important topic. Thank you. Thank you very much Jörg. Uh, very very nice talk um, and also not only thanks for sharing with us some of the coping strategies that you think might be useful for us all and for many of our attendees but also uh, thanks for uh, reminding us that it's important to know ourselves, to understand ourselves uh, and to draw our own iceberg to know how we um, would, um, can face more effectively uh, mental health issues. So our last speaker for the day, um, uh, and I'm very happy uh, he was able to join us uh, from the other side, sort of the other side of the world where it's still night. We have uh, uh, Chris Woodson, uh, who's a journalist um, who um, sometimes works uh, among others for nature uh, and who uh, is really, um, um, finds really important discussing about uh, uh, mental health issues for young researchers. So I don't want to um, take any of your time. So please, Chris, um, your, the floor is yours. Hey guys, my name is Chris Wollston. I'm really happy to be here. 
It is just after five in the morning here in Billings, Montana. Uh, I can also add, you, you can see it's dark outside still, and we're surrounded by forest fire smoke. Uh, things are really heating up here in Montana, and believe me when I say I wish I was there. Um, but I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to have some time to talk. So um, I used to be a scientist, you could guess, uh, a long time ago. Uh, I only have a master's degree. I studied algae and nitrogen in uh, lakes in Antarctica. And I quickly realized that uh, I was actually better at other things, uh, namely writing. And to this day, that's the only thing that I'm good at. Uh, I'm not good at presentations and I don't have a problem with perfectionism as I, as I think will become very clear. Um, but I, I do wanna say that uh, I've been writing for Nature probably for the last seven years or so. And at Nature Careers especially, we are very concerned about anything that is an obstacle in science. We're concerned about racial diversity. We're concerned about gender diversity. We're concerned about immigration issues. We're concerned about any kind of discrimination and harassment. And lately we've been very concerned about mental health issues for a couple of reasons. Um, one, we, um, I think there's plenty of evidence that they're, they're very common very, um, throughout the science careers, but especially er early career scientists. And for that group, it's not just a matter of um, hindering their work, which it certainly does. But I think it's driving people from science. I think people are quitting and I think that's affecting things like diversity. It's affecting productivity. And um, we just want to make it a, a big priority of ours to point it out wherever we can and just keep reporting on this so people know that it's happening. Uh, we don't have a lot of solutions. You know, that's not necessarily our job, but our job is to keep um, reminding people that this is an issue. And one of the things I wanted to talk about, and this year we did a survey of postdocs for the first time. In the past, we've done surveys of PhD students and we've done surveys of scientists in general. And this year we wanted to know about postdocs, which I think is uh, an underappreciated part of the scientific workforce. And you folks will be the first in the world to see any of these numbers. I'm not gonna uh, talk about all of them because that would take forever, but I wanted to talk about a couple of things that, uh, that are important. So we asked a few uh, COVID questions because you know <laughs> we thought that this would be a timely time to do that. And, and we asked if they thought that their careers had already been affected by this. And this survey ran from the middle of June until the end of July. And by that time, 61% said that they thought that it had been negatively effective. 25% said they weren't sure, which you know probably means that it certainly could be. And uh, as the, is noted here, people with long-term health um, problems, disabilities were especially likely to say that their careers had been affected. And um, we, we saw lots of differences. And when I write on this, we'll get into more details, but it was interesting that uh, people who were like in chemistry and math were less likely to say that. And people who were in more experimental fields were more likely to say that. And you can see how that would be, but here's, the questions, I, the answers that I thought were uh, very alarming and very fascinating. We asked, have you sought help or received professional help for depression or anxiety related to your work? 20% said yes, but even more said that they hadn't, but they wanted to. So together, 46% feel like they would like to have professional help because of their work, but even more uh, or have not done so than have done so. So that's pretty, both of those numbers are, I think, uh, notable. It says my internet connection is unstable, hope we're okay. Um, and then here's the question that I think is really one of the take homes for the entire survey. Have you considered leaving science because of depression, anxiety, or mental health concerns related to your work? 51% said yes. And that just gets exactly why we keep talking about mental health issues. Um, these are again postdocs. They're from all over. We had, we got responses from 93 countries, over 7,000 postdocs, and we have half of them saying that they've thought about just quitting. And uh, I don't doubt that it's true, but I also think that we can't. Um, we we just have to keep that number in mind and keep that issue in mind. And that's exactly why uh, mental health issues are so uh, important for us to be following and for everyone to know about. We asked postdocs about discrimination. 
we, which of these have you experienced directly? Um, I can't see that number, but quite, a, excuse me, quite a few uh, say that they have um, experienced bullying, power imbalances. 40% say they, ha they have personally experienced gender discrimination. Uh, interestingly, 10% of those were men. 24% um, said they have experienced racial dis discrimination or harassment. We also asked them who is the perpetrator, and look at that, it's uh, the supervisor in, in most cases. And this is something that has come up in our uh, other surveys of PhD students, of, uh, of scientists in general, that when people have experienced any kind of what they consider to be harassment, bullying, um, yeah, the, the supervisor is uh, the most likely perpetrator. Uh, we have reason, so this has been going on for a while, mental health issues, we've been watching them, but uh, I think there's strong reason to believe that they are more common than ever. Uh, and you would might suspect that because of the pandemic, um, that that is unleashing a lot of anxiety, as you can imagine, but also depression. And this really came to light in a, uh, this was in Nature just, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, uh, a story I wrote. And this was a, a survey that was, it's very American centric, but I think it's still very telling. They did a survey with um, 15,000 graduate students responded to this, and they were able to compare these results to last year. And this survey was done right at the height of the uh, pandemic in, uh, in uh, May and June, I believe. And they found that the rates of depression were double what they were last year with the same, not exactly the same respondents, but the same kinds of respondents at research universities. And anxiety had increased 50%. Um, and they couldn't say for sure that it was because of the pandemic, but everybody knows it was because of the pandemic that that was a major part of it. And I think this is very important. Um, th these are rates of anxiety. You can see that the, uh, the baseline was 39. So 39% showed signs of general anxiety disorder. This, it wasn't a completely accurate diagnosis. They were just showing signs. It was a very brief questionnaire. But when you break it down into subgroups, you see that some groups were far more likely to report signs of anxiety than others. We have income issues, low income, working class were more likely than um, wealthy middle-class students. Um, we have uh, Latino students were more likely, uh, American, Indian, Alaska Native. But one thing that really jumped out at me was the issue of sexual orientation. People who were not, who didn't identify as heterosexual or straight were extremely more likely to report anxiety and uh, you know, that's something that obviously that I feel requires uh, closer examination. There's a lot going on there. Um, interestingly, caregivers for children were not more likely to report anxiety, although everyone knows that they struggled during the pandemic, but people who are caring for adults definitely were uh, more likely. I am now going to the next slide. Giving presentations is not my strong point. So um, as I said, we do these surveys every year. This year we're doing postdocs and last year we did a PhD story. And we, we had responses from over 6,000 PhD students from around the world. And just as in other surveys, it's interesting. We get a lot of people who say they're satisfied, satisfied with science, like around 60% say, uh, yeah, I'm you know, pretty happy with my life. I'm glad I did science. I would probably do it again if I had a chance, but uh, we asked them about uh, mental health issues and 30%, 36% said that they had, they had sought help for anxiety or depression caused by their PhD studies. So that's not just because they were depressed or anxious. Um, they specifically said that because of their PhD studies. And we kind of got into the, the numbers a little bit more about what is going on. And we have um, some pretty hefty work weeks for these PhD students, as you can see. And we asked them to kind of break down their experience as PhD students. And we have, for instance, on the top line, the culture at my university calls for long hours and sometimes working through the night, 49%. So that's not great. 
Uh, we asked them if their university offers schemes to promote mental health and well-being. 41% said that, so less than half. My university supports a good work-life balance, uh, way less than half. So I think that these studies and what we try to do is you know, try to get to some of the root causes of the, uh, the issues here. And like I said at the beginning, I don't feel like we have a lot of answers. Um, if someone did have answers, I would love to interview them and put them in a story. But what we can do is let everybody know that this is happening. And this is something that we're going to do again and again, story after story, survey after survey. And I think that helps in a couple of ways. Uh, I think that the scientists themselves know that it's not an isolated event if they're feeling anxious, um, overwhelmed, depressed. I think it's very important for PIs to know that this is going on in their groups. This is going on for their postdocs, for their PhD students. And um, it may be affecting their work. And if they're showing any signs of quitting, they, you know, they may need an intervention. Someone may need to be talked to them about, may need to talk to them about what's going on. Um, and we just want everyone to know that uh, we haven't forgotten about this. We're gonna keep reporting it and we hope people keep paying attention. Um, we did have uh, some questions about in a similar vein as, to, as the postdoc um, about gender discrimination again was about 40%, which was the same for the postdocs and 85% of those were women. Um, in this case, only 21% of uh, PhD students said they had experienced any kind of um, discrimination. So uh, I don't know, maybe that's uh, something to take a slightly positive number. Of course, any amount is too much. Um, and I just wanna say, I'm serious, Montana is great. Uh, anybody's welcome. You know, I'm, I'm easy to find. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And, uh, and thanks for uh, letting me share. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, for um, uh, a very, very interesting presentation. Um, I would say sort of sad results in terms of what they share. Uh, so, but thanks a lot for sharing this data with us. Uh, and I hope that this session has uh, provided some uh, ideas and tools on how to approach um, mental health issues in case you face them. So with the few minutes left, I just want to uh, first, and I know that this is the opposite of what uh, one would do normally, but I first want to share with all of you uh, uh, the acknowledgement slide, and I want to thank again all the speakers uh, uh, for being here. Uh, and you can find on this slide all the handles on Twitter for Twitter or for Facebook to contact all of our speakers. Uh, as the discussion time is quite short, so we won't be able to answer all of the questions uh, uh, today. Um, but feel free to reach out to uh, any of them or us. Um, you can find me anywhere, basically, you just need to Google my name and Matteo and Luca need uh, um, a special acknowledgement, uh, they are the other organizers of this session. So with, so with, these, uh, with the few minutes left, uh, what I would like to do is I would like to um, answer with all of our speakers um, one or two of the questions that we received in these days um, with uh, from uh, some of the uh, attendees uh, that uh, um, uh, contacted us in advance. And so uh, the first question that I would like to uh, ask to all of you um, is uh, if you can, uh, if you could give uh, your, to your young self or to a young researcher uh, an advice on uh, either how to face for example, this uh, Jenny mentioned that throughout our career we have ups and downs. How do we? How would you face uh, these downs, uh, these low moments, uh, if you could go back now, uh, or in case of in the case of Chris and Diego, what kind of advice would you give to someone who is facing these lows? So uh, I would start. Uh, from Jenny, because she's the one that wrote the first uh, point, and then we go uh, with the others. Go, Jenny. Very okay, short yeah. question. 
please. For yeah. Special answers, please. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So definitely uh, something that I can see no one's doing, and I've already mentioned, which is I wish I had um, confided in my peers. So they don't have to be people in your group. If you feel like there's a competitive element, it could be just someone who is in your year group because they are going through the same thing as you. And I do that a lot more now, and it's incredible. So it's um, it's hive minds. You, you go through the same problems together. You can empathize better. So I would just say reach out to your peers. Thanks a lot. Jörg? You are muted. Yeah. Sorry, short answer is to not stay within the bubble of academia. Please uh, go through it and uh, use also peers and mentors outside of it. Uh, because you will be in a, like Facebook, in a wrong feedback circle if you only ask your PI or other PIs who made it. That's not okay. going to help. So really facing reality, even if you want to stay in academia, that's okay. But numbers say that uh, maybe five out of 100 people may make it. So be, re uh, be re um, realistic and don't be demotivated, but also face reality and um, see what else is out there. Thanks. Diego? Yes. So I'll be super brief. Uh, I would say that if you are uh, facing st some struggles, uh, act sooner rather than later, because the longer you wait, the worse. Uh, it becomes so don't uh, don't wait thanks very good point <laughs> i would have another one like the diego said also if you have a conflict i mean mainly it's with your supervisor so don't uh, regard it as a threat but if the conflict is still very small regard it as a chance and in leadership course whatever you can learn how to approach conflicts and they can actually bring you further they will not be a threat but they can actually solve something very true Please. I would say embrace what you're good at. Um, I realized that early on as a scientist that I was much better at writing about science than doing it. And that was partly, you know, my failures as a person. But <laughs> I, was, I was not good at, at being meticulous about the, the science. Um, and I would also say um, that, yeah, just, just embracing your strengths and being interested in, in what you're working in. Uh, when I talk to people who maybe struggling a little bit with science, that's the one thing that they always say that saves them is that they really like their topic. And if it's, if you're not doing a topic that you find fascinating, it may be time to look elsewhere. Great, thanks a lot. Um, so unfortunately we have only a um, few seconds left. Uh, I just want to uh, say again that I really enjoyed the talks. Uh, the idea was not only to mention which kind of mental health issues the researchers, young researchers face in academia and, uh, and outside academia, but also what can we do uh, as young researchers to solve this problem or try to address these problems. And I hope we did that all together. Uh, so don't forget to um, contact us in case you have any additional question or you just want to reach out and discuss your uh, personal situation. And thanks a lot for being with us today. Thank you all. Bye.